nearly half of dementias could theoretically be prevented by completely eliminating these 14 risk factors. Yeah. That's a wild statement. Not wild, but it's it's fantastic statement. Well, yeah, I think it's hopeful. And um, it takes us from a place where I think we all have fears that get the best of us. We're at risk, our exposures, our, our environment, our genetics that we weren't able to control in some way um, are inextricably um, uh, and kind of uh, perpetually uh, uh, imposing a risk on us that we're never going to be over, able to overcome with lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But this suggests um, probably that's not the case. There's probably a lot we can do to prevent the onset of dementia or at least prolong the onset of dementia. So make it come on later or or develop a cognitive reserve to uh, the, def the deficits and, and injuries that occur over right. a, a long period of time so right. that we can maintain a healthy brain and healthy brain function um, over a longer period of time. That's an important point. And the point that I want to piggyback on top of that, that I mentioned at the beginning is even if you develop dementia by addressing these 14 modifiable risk factors, you could potentially be increasing the number of years that you'll be healthy with that diagnosis right. and decreasing the number of frailty years that you have with that diagnosis, which yeah. I think is just as just as massive. Like addressing these 14 modifiable risk factors might prevent the dementia, might ward off the diagnosis of dementia. And even if you get the diagnosis of dementia, um, potentially extend the healthy years that yeah. you can have with that diagnosis. So yep. that's why I think these risk factors are just uh, huge. I heard someone talk about, uh, maybe this will be better suited for when we talk about exercise, but um, what if, you know, somebody approached you or a commercial came on the air and said, look, we've got this treatment and it could reduce your chances of having dementia by four times. It could mm -hmm. um, improve your mood and uh, improve your sleep and boost your cognition. Um, it doesn't cost anything necessarily. And the side effects are as minor as uh, a strained ligament or, or uh, sore muscles. Mm. That treatment would go, you know, like uh, crazy anywhere you sell it, right. if it was a pill. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's exercise, you know, in a nutshell. Yeah. And so we're talking about things that people can literally do, uh, and we could all do more of. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think it, it's a hopeful note. And one thing that I think this new commission statement or report provides is another 5% on their equation from 2020. So 2020 is a 40% preventable. Now right, they're so, saying so contextualize that a little bit. They came out with a similar report four years ago and and they said 40 percent of uh, cases of dementia are preventable. Right. Um, and, and um, they provided how many modifiable risk factors? It was less than 14. I think it was three less. It was, it was 12. I think they added um, LDL cholesterol and um, vision. Was it vision loss? Yeah, they added vision loss and LDL cholesterol to, the, to this new commission report. And so with that, um, you know, they're, they're gaining additional uh, predictive power of who might go on to have dementia mm -hmm. with these risk factors. And um, it's, it's a helpful roadmap. And I think the infographic that's associated with the uh, report mm -hmm. um, kind of is a slam dunk for me. It's something I can use uh, with my patients every day of the week, you know, mm -hmm. pull up this image and talk them through. In fact, I use it for myself. I use it for you know, motivation to think about what is it that I can do today or measure today to get a sense of where I'm at mm -hmm. and what I can do to incrementally kind of pinch down on the risk uh, or boost up on, on the uh, the potential for me to have a brain healthy life through my lifespan. Yeah. So if you look at that figure, it's figure nine, um, you can see up at the top, there's um, a, a, an early life segment and, and then the uh, graphic takes you through kind of a timeline throughout the lifespan and when each risk factor might show up and be most potent based on the current evidence. Mm. And so um, in early life, um, less education is a, is a potent risk factor, 5% in, uh, increased risk. Um, and then uh, contributory to uh, uh, the, the risk of, of having uh, 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 dementia yeah, in early life. Quick tangent on education. This is a factor that we see 
all the time come up in these papers mm-hmm. and all these research studies and the even the young onset it was a factor here it's an here it's a factor clearly um this is a huge factor when you're talking about the ri- modifiable risk factor for dementia yep and um you know i think at the end of the day we're probably talking about a proxy for access uh, who has access to good education, mm-hmm. has access to other good resources, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the finances to to afford them the types of foods and exercise programs and so on and so forth yeah. uh, early in life to, to make these things uh, habits. Uh, but also, it probably lays down framework for what we call cognitive mm-hmm. reserve, yeah. which is the um, uh, partially kind of... Uh, fluid intelligence or the, the ability to uh, learn new things and and um, and become proficient and, and expert in things. Are you aware of any ways to measure cognitive reserve yourself? If someone's like, hey, I want to know how much cognitive reserve I have. It's a good question, though. I don't yeah. know. There's been some recent work looking at um, MRI to um, compare an individual structural MRI against a massive uh, a database of normal mm-hmm. uh, age and um, gender and demographic uh, kind of normed mm-hmm. um, MRIs, and um, you can create a brain age from mm-hmm. that. Um, I don't know if that's mainstream. I don't know if you could do that uh, just coming off the street into you know UCLA to get your your images. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know cognitive testing wise whether you can claim uh, a series of cognitive scores in a neuropsychological battery, for example, um, would help you gauge your cognitive reserve. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we know boosts cognitive reserve is being fluent in more than one language. Mm -hmm. Um, And so building that into your child's life um, gives them a a leg up in Mm -hmm. in a way uh, against all things. Hearing loss coming up again, 7% um, as a modifiable risk factor um, for dementia. Uh, We saw it in young onset dementia. But let's scroll down a little bit because we're, since we're talking about hearing loss, vision loss, 2% later in life. I mean, vision loss is something that's extremely common later in life. And it being a risk factor for dementia is, uh, is new in this paper and it's pretty striking. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Again, that sensory, sensory deprivation thing coming up again, right? Hearing loss, social isolation, vision loss, yeah. And then, you know, we can talk about um, olfaction and how it relates to dementia, but I think we'll leave that, we'll table that, we'll uh, leave that for a later episode. But Yeah, I don't know the, the uh, mechanistic relationship between vision loss and um, uh, its attribution to risk for dementia, other than, you know, just using common sense, not having an input there and risking not having good visual acuity right. is going to cause accidents and other, sure. right. other things related to yep. worsened outcomes. Yep. What else jumps out at you? Um, the looking at kind of the the timeline of things, I think, adds a lot to this picture. Mm-hmm. And then, um, uh, kind of putting on the map, which we we talked only briefly about before, traumatic brain injury. It was actually in the young onset database, but they didn't have enough uh, detail from. Uh, looking through the medical charts if somebody had a traumatic brain injury and what type of injury it was and and and, um, and so they they weren't able to use that in their models but um, here clearly there's been tons of studies that have said traumatic brain injuries of any severity um, any number have um, some uh, increase um, uh, can increase risk of, of dementia and neurodegeneration yeah. so that's important to put on the map um, those can be prevented or mitigated to some extent mm-hmm. Uh, physical inactivity is a good one. Brings up exercise, inactivity. You know, putting it that way. Right. Uh, you can think about sitting as the new smoking. Yeah. I don't agree with that, yeah. and I like. Uh, uh, I think it's Dan Lieberman's view of that from uh, Harvard uh, in his book Exercised. Mm-hmm. I've seen him say, you know what, you know, evolutionarily, um, we uh, didn't run around all time, all the time hunting. Mm-hmm. We sat a lot of the time, or, or uh, they sat a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Except they just didn't sat for prolonged periods of time, two mm-hmm. hours at a time, mm-hmm. like we do in a yeah. particular posture. They got up frequently, yeah. and so inactivity for a prolonged period of time um, is a risk factor diabetes, smoking, hypertension, obesity, excessive alcohol, 
those are a little bit more obvious. Social so isolation we, shows up again. Okay, so we put all those risk factors together in midlife, and um, what's the aggregate of what, of what we're looking like for the things that happen in midlife that dictate um, our dementia risk later on in life? What is that, 30%? About. That's pretty yeah. striking. Yeah. You know? Yep. And I think it lends to the fact that we can be doing things now. Exactly. You know, well, in our Brain Health Project uh, at UCLA, the, the course that we're doing where we're learning all about the reality of some of these risk factors and uh, trying to decode some of the myths and trends and fads that are out there. Um, you, at the end of the day, um, the young students are, are thinking, is this related to me and my life? Right. Can I do something now? Mm -hmm. Should I do something? Should I be worried about this? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is you can do something now. Yeah. You can do something at 40. You can do something at 70 yeah. and still make incremental gains in brain health. Well, they're undergraduates at UCLA, so they're definitely hitting the education piece pretty <laughs> hard. <laughs> what else? Anything else jump out at you? Well, um, sauna. So, is sauna on that? <laughs> sauna isn't on here, but, um, you know, I've, I've been hearing a lot about sauna, about preventing dementia. It comes from a study uh, out in Finland. I think of, I forget exactly what the end was, but it might have been 200 Finnish males. Um, I think it was maybe a 60% reduction in people that use sauna four to seven times a week, hmm. right? Um, thoughts? You know, sauna in isolation doesn't get at all of the other things that are probably related to somebody who can sauna, sure. who can participate in an expensive right. act like that. So I think... Um, because also uh, people with heart disease are told not to do sauna, mm, right? Mm. It's a risk. People yeah. can, you know, so Maybe the individuals who are in the study don't have heart disease. Right. I, I don't exactly. know that study, yeah. but that's always what I'm looking for. And I think it's a good point is like, look, there's going to be a ton of new data all the time. Right. The, the skeptic, um, the good kind of reader of this information that's trying to be responsible about how they spend their money to get the most impact mm -hmm. in terms of health gains is looking at that in the context of all things that have been done um, and looking at that in the context of, well, what else did they measure? How, how did they sure this thing up? Was it just in men? Was it just in white men? Was it just, um, you know, without looking at the effects of age or other comorbid conditions like cardiovascular or diabetes and other things like that? And so I think you always got to take those um, new pieces of data and um, you know, put it to the fire and see right. if it holds. Yeah.